So today we're going to talk about AI and how we can use it to uh, help uh, help solve the, the digital accessibility problem and how uh, you know the the future of, of of accessibility tools can take advantage of uh, the um, uh, the the help that these types of, of generative AI models can provide while not falling into some of the pitfalls that uh, are have uh, uh, equally been been found. So uh, to just jump right in, uh, AI is clearly a tool that's going to help us and, and in, in ways that uh, we can we've measured so far, um, GitHub did a, a controlled study of the impact that using a, a an AI tool like GitHub Copilot can have on both the productivity and the satisfaction when it comes to uh, developers. Uh, they did a study uh, last year where they had, you know, about a hundred developers. They split them in half. Half of them uh, used a, used GitHub Copilot to write a web server. Uh, and the other half didn't. Um, and what was really interesting is, you know, we expect it to uh, to help make things go faster. But to the point, uh, over ninety minutes was the amount of time that it that was the, was the delta. The average time with Copilot was seventy one minutes, and the, the average time without was one hundred and sixty one point uh, minutes. And so to be able to increase that amount of speed is is, is awesome. And if you dug into the study a little bit, some of the more interesting parts that that I found were that um, the the developers really enjoyed using Copilot because it didn't necessarily take the challenge away from the development process. What it did is it it took uh, and and kind of handled the more redundant parts, the more boring parts uh, that are easily done by AI, and it left the interesting challenges for the uh, for the developers to solve. So it essentially you know, helped uh, uh, the developers kind of save their brain power and 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 mental energy for uh, the problems that are that are more fun. So, I think the bottom line here is that you know these types of tools they they help make people fast pass faster at developing code, but also developers are going to want to use them. It makes their job easier. It makes their job more fun. They get to do more of the fun part of coding as opposed to the um, the kind of tedium. So, however, um, this is the 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 uh, the fun part. The problem is is that there are a number of different areas in which, uh, well, at least we uh, challenges to work through when when using AI models like this. Now, thankfully, um, the uh, uh, problems like this are becoming less. However. Uh, there's a lot of work to do to make uh, that bias go away. So here we have uh, um, a prompt that someone was given, uh, wrote into ChatGPT, where they were asked to write a Python function to check if someone would be a good scientist based on a JSON description of their race, race and gender. And uh, gender, excuse me. And uh, the return was clearly biased toward white males, which was uh, incredible, in, uh, a huge problem. And Fortunately, that seems to be fixed, so that's uh, good. But bias is one of the, the the problems that we have with these AI models, and uh, unfortunately, that impacts us significantly when considering accessibility as well. And we'll dig into that a little bit more as we look at the uh, hands-on uh, tools. And then another one is hallucinations. So, for example, um, if we provide a prompt. For example, write a letter, write a sentence that ends with the letter S. Uh, Chat GPT has, has presented a, uh, a a response that says, you know, the birds in the trees swing sweetly at dawn. So it's a sentence that uses the letter S quite a bit, but it doesn't end with the letter S. So uh, we have to be careful about our expectations around how what kind of responses we're going to be one going to get and in this case we also have to consider uh what the prompt is and how we need to communicate with these types of models to get the answers that we're looking for so events has taken approach where we want to be able to take this and uh take the the 
velocity increase. Take the take the ability to uh, reduce the amount of tedium and, and increase satisfaction, and do that in a way that that helps uh, solve the the digital accessibility problem. And so our our goals is to do that in three different ways. First. Uh, is intent detection. One of the great things that we can do with AI is use it to understand the context of the code that we're developing, or in the case of design, in the type of design that we're creating. Um, the second thing is to really dig into these uh, AI models with the expertise and understand how to handle the prompt engineering, which uh, when it comes to creating prompts and and trying to get uh, uh, responses that are both deterministic and correct, these prompts end up being extremely complex and, and oftentimes very long in order to get the types of, of answers we need to make uh, productive change. And then third is guardrails. We need to make sure and constrain the results from the eye to AI to make sure that they are accessible. So with these three areas, intent detection, expertise, and guardrails, we can use these tools in a way that's extremely helpful. So we will go ahead and start with a design, and, and we want to do this at every step. So we're starting with design, how can we use AI to improve the process uh, of design in general and making sure that designers are always designing, uh, creating designs that can be made accessible from the very beginning? How can we help uh, uh, developers, folks that are using these AI models, how can we make sure that the, 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 the help that they're getting from these tools like GitHub Copilot is not only returning code that makes their jobs easier and, and faster and, and gives them better satisfaction, but how can we make sure that what type of code is returned is also accessible and can be used by anybody? One, and the, how can we use AI to find existing accessibility problems, which of course are always gonna happen? How can we use it to find problems? And then also at the end, once we've found the problems, how can we use it also to fix, help fix those problems in a way that uh, is meaningful. And so that's, uh, Evinced has developed our second generation of tools, which we are extremely excited about that uh, do exactly that. So I'm gonna start by uh, taking a look at our design tool. And uh, the way this works is the AI and the design is uh, somewhat under the hood. So, on the screen, on the left side, we have a, um, a uh, it's an accordion pattern, uh, which is essentially just a drop down. And if you click on it, it will, um, you know, expose some more information. And so the first thing that we do with the design assistant is we select the, the, the component that we're designing, and then we're going to scan that design to determine which ARIA pattern it maps to. And in this case, the AI has determined that it's most likely an accordion pattern. That happens to be correct. So we can select that and then go on to mapping the components. And this is really the key. If you know the type of, of component that you're developing, or if, 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 if the events tool can, or or the tool itself knows which type of component you're developing, then we know exactly what states are required in order to make it accessible uh, from the start. So that way, if it's missing a per particular uh, state, uh, then when you go to development, there's not a chance that the developer can really make it accessible because it's missing the state at the design level. So, uh, oops. Go back, the, so again, we're analyzing the component. And then once the co component is analyzed and we understand that it's an uh, accordion pattern, we then analyze the current states that are there. So in this case, we have a default collapse state and a default extended, expanded state, but we are missing the required focus states. And so that is our next task. Uh, we need to um, go through 
and create a copy of these and create the focus states. And now uh, we've fulfilled the requirements for the accessibility label. We uh, can scan it for all the, the traditional things like color contrast and text spacing and, and all of things like that. And then uh, uh, we're able to, to provide uh, information to developers and designers in order to understand uh, how to develop that uh, in an accessible way. So the key here is that with AI, uh, we were able to take the underlying data from within Figma, use the visual aspects as well, use a uh, both AI and machine learning models to determine what type of design that we're creating, and then map it to an ARIA pattern, and then provide the designer with guardrails that helps them create accessible designs every time they're developing a new component. So that's how we can help from the design perspective. Next, we'll look at how we can approach it from the code uh, from the code perspective. And for that, I'm going to jump into a, a live demo where I'll just pull up my IDE, which is uh, uh, VS Code in this case. And I am today going to put my shoes in a uh, as a, a front end developer where I'm developing a tab list of orchestral instruments. Uh, uh, a secret about me is I used to be a uh, professional musician uh, playing in symphonies. And so I'm creating my website here where uh, I'm listing out um, uh, different types of instrument families. So I have GitHub Copilot linked in here. And the nice thing about this is if I'm trying to create a list of orchestral instruments, all I can do is I've left a comment. And if I just hit the enter button, uh, it will create a tab list for me. Now, as we look at this, we can see that it's been built with, built with divs. Um, I'm not seeing any sort of ARIA roles or, or anything that may, would make this accessible. And uh, this is kind of the underlying problem. As, as more developers are using tools like GitHub Copilot or or Amazon Code Whisper or uh, many of the the various others. While much of the code that has trained this type of tool is is accessible and does provide good examples, unfortunately, the overwhelming majority is not. And so the training that they provide and the overwhelming answers that that they uh, that, that are fed back to the user are with code that is is not accessible. And so this is actually a really huge problem because as the, from the from the outside of our, our our talk here, if both developers really want to use these types of tools, which nobody can blame them for, it makes their job easier and more fun, and they're able to develop code even faster. The prospect that this code won't be accessible really compounds our current problem that we have today because code will be, uh, you know, code features applications will be developed at a, at a faster pace, potentially with just as many or more accessibility issues than than we're finding today. And uh, for for folks that are on the front lines trying to to kind of, you know, mitigate these problems day in and day out. That is not a, a proposition that we want to to, to deal with. To have uh, more more problems to find uh, at all times. So, in order to to mitigate this, uh, we have we can uh, continue. Uh, we just uh, we generate the code. We can even uh, generate more options. Uh, and so perhaps. You know, we'll get lucky, and and uh, uh, Copilot will provide us something a little bit better with the the kind of uh, additional options. But, but unfortunately, the the options that are provided, none of them really have any sort of accessibility in mind at all. We've just got divs and H1, H2 list items, uh, nothing interactive. It's it's all very very inaccessible, and so uh, this inherently uh, shows the underlying problem, and. Not only just with HTML, we can also add script tags and it can it can generate the JavaScript as well. And <laughs> this time, uh, ChatGTP is funny. Yeah, uh, just in this case, put a comment of write your code here. Uh, again, with the hallucinations that we discovered uh, discussed earlier. So now we can 
take a look. So if we were to build an application that uses with just GitHub Copilot uh, uh, taking charge, we would see that uh, uh, we would create a, an application that uh, behaves as following. So on the screen now, I have uh, just a general template with a tab list that lists, you know, string instruments with a description and an option to learn more. We've got uh, a wind instruments tab uh, as well as a percussion tab. And if we were able to, if we were just to tab through this, uh, we would go from uh, first, we're on the first tab and now uh, an accessible application, we would expect it to enter into the tab panel and then go to the learn more button or link. Uh, but unfortunately, it goes straight from the, the string tab to the next tab over, which is the winds tab, uh, and then the percussion tab, and then it jumps into the tab panel uh, and, and shows learn more. And so if I was a screen reader users, I, user, I'd hear string, wind, percussion, and learn more, and I'd think I was learning more about percussion. And so here uh, is the underlying problem. So... At events, what we've done is we have created an intermediary. So I'll uh, go ahead and uh, uh, revert this. I'm going to go ahead and add our uh, events copilot. We'll just save that. And uh, what I need to do is just close out, um, close out the VS Code just to clear any cache, anything like that. And so now I'm going to do exact same thing I did before. I've got our initial tab list. It's got the comment with string, winds, per percussion. And when I hit the uh, enter key this time, uh, I'm expecting to see something very, very different. And in fact, we do. This time, instead of a, 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 a ton of you know, list items and divs and things like that, I'm seeing uh, HTML buttons with... ARIA roles, ARIA controls, IDs, ARIA selected, all of these types of things that we're expecting to see. And in fact, if I were to create some, some broader options, we would see be able to show uh, uh, some, uh, once uh, GitHub response here, we're seeing much more of what we're excited about. First, uh, the, the answers being provided by events, we've got roles, tabs, all sorts of things where uh, we can review the, the different suggestions, find the one that works for us, and uh, accept it and move over. And so this way, Events is uh, both using the intent detection piece, where we can tell that we're looking at a tab list, and so we can provide the HTML in, in an accessible way for that type of component. Uh, we're using the expertise as far as the intent detection of communicating because we know it's a tab list, uh, communicating to Chatbeat GPT all of the different areas that uh, uh, are required for a tab list. And uh, throughout this process, I really don't want to be throwing you know, developers under the hood. I mean, many great developers um, know about accessibility or are doing the right thing. And, and 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 doing the best they can to, to create accessible code. The problem is, is that like all of us, developers have a lot on their mind and remembering what to do when it comes to accessibility is actually a really tall order. If we go look at the, the different uh, ARIA role models, uh, what we've got here is an, a, an insane spider web of correlations based on the type of, of uh, of element we're creating, where even the tab list, we have to know about ARIA level, ARIA uh, multi-selectable, multi ARIA orientation, all of these things. And let alone remember knowing how to be a developer, remembering all of these things is, is just almost too much for, uh, for anyone. And so what this allows us to do is create the code as you normally would, and it helps guide developers to creating the uh, accessible code in a way that's uh, equally as fast and equally as enjoyable for them. The And they just don't have to think about uh, one less thing to think about where we, we help them create accessible code as we go. So jumping back into our, to our, our example site here, uh, what we can now do is uh, try again. Let's let's try our tab. 
Uh, first, uh, we go to the first tab. That's excellent. We're on the strings tab. And then instead of going to the next tab over, we're going into the tab panel. Highlighted that. We go to the uh, learn more. Uh, then we go to the next tab. Uh, we can use the arrow keys to get to the next tab. As expected, we can get in and, and everything works the way it is supposed to here, uh, <laughs> except for my tabbing ability. So um, we're able to do this. And so with the guardrails provided by the evinced uh, tool, we're able to then provide uh, accessible code and create accessible um, uh, features. All right. So uh, the next area we want to talk about is how are we able to find more accessibility issues, existing issues, uh, when looking through, uh, you know, our, the code that's already developed, already out there. When we're finding problems, how can we do that in a way that is uh, gives us the ability to reduce the amount of manual effort that it takes to go through every page of your website with a, a screen reader and uh, a keyboard and what have you. And now, of course, I'm not going to sit here and claim that we the, the, we have the ability to find all problems, but using modern technology, we can find a lot more than any other tool, which again, similar to Copilot, it's it makes your job easier. You're doing less tedium. You're you're doing the stuff. You're finding the harder problems that uh, are uh, are are better to find and fix quickly. And so, uh, what we'll do here is uh, I'm a quick download to show how the technology is used to uh, be able to detect more issues. So. Just as a baseline, um, what we'll do is we'll just, uh, I've, I've loaded up a, 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 a dummy website here. It's just a, it's meant to mimic a travel site where you can, you know, select the type of vacation you want to have, where you want to go. There's a date picker so you can select when you want to go. And then there's also a search button so that you can, you know, complete the search and, and uh, get your results. And so the first thing we can do to just set the baseline here is just run uh, a legacy tool. We'll you will open up uh, Muddy House and, and use Google Lighthouse. And this is a fine tool. Uh, uh, it is able to find some some interesting accessibility issues. But the problem is 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 really in the way that it works. Um, uh, Lighthouse uses Axe for under the hood again. Uh, there's some nice issues that you can find there. But the way that Axe works is it it essentially just looks at the HTML. It's an, an, analyzing the syntax and really just essentially checking to see if anything's missing. And so what that what happens is because you don't have an understanding of how the user is meant to interact with the, with the website, uh, you don't have enough context to find a lot of accessibility issues, especially some of the critical ones uh, involving you know critical screen reader issues and, and keyboard accessible issues. Uh, that might be uh, the ones that are really uh, preventing users from from using your website in an appropriate way. So, even though we've got a score of a uh, hundred from from Lighthouse, if I were to tab into this website and hit the the tab key one time, uh, unfortunately, I'd skip over the first drop down, the second drop down. Uh, I can get through the date picker okay, but Unfortunately, uh, I'm not able to get to the search button either. And that's because uh, uh, these elements have been coded uh, incorrectly uh, from an accessibility perspective and honestly, a development perspective as, as well. And unfortunately, while this is obviously a demo site, these are the types of issues that we see over and over uh, across the, the web. Uh, where these types of things are, they make uh, elements that are meant to be interacted with impossible to, to get to. And so in the case of a, a site like this, if I were a, a keyboard only user, the only thing I can do on this site is select a date, which is, is not good for anybody. So what I'll, I'll go ahead and do is I'll just fire up events. And the events approach is a little bit different. And the way that we analyze the page is, again, using the modern tape technology, we use computer vision, machine learning, as well as AI, to gain additional context. So we analyze the page, 
And we're able to determine that, hey, okay, we've got a, a top level heading at the top of the page that says, you know, travel, book your stay. Then Events understands that you've got a form with two drop downs, you know, where you want to go, what type of vacation, the day picker to choose when, and then a search button. So the key is, for example, uh, the search button, Events knows ahead of time that this search button is a button and that uh, a user is meant to interact with it. And so in that particular case, when a um, when we then look at the the HTML code, we have a set of expectations uh, as opposed to just looking if something's missing. So we're expecting to see uh, an HTML button tag uh, with all the lovely accessibility features built in. Uh, or at the very least, uh, we're expecting to see the the various ARIA attributes that would be required in order to say, you know, gain keyboard focus or declare its role to the screen reader, what have you. And so it's when we don't see those is we can go ahead and uh, scan the page very quickly and we can determine that there are accessibility issues on these elements where other tools can't because we have used the the technology to determine that uh how this page is meant to be used and so then we know how to test it so this is how we can use uh these technologies to to detect more issues now uh jumping back to our slides so great we can find uh more issues faster uh what do we do once we found them how do we fix them well, in almost exactly the same way as we saw before. What we do is, uh, of course, like, like tools do, we provide all of the information around uh, the type of, of issues that we've detected. And then we uh, take all of that information and we have a uh, uh, get with the broken DOM snippet. We have the, you know, severity, the, the type of issues we have, the, 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 um, since we have access to the HTML and the visual aspects and the, the analysis we've done, we can use all of that to send a prompt to a generative, generative AI tool to get a, an explanation of how we should fix this issue. And so um, when we do that, we just simply would click uh, the get fix suggestion. And what that would do is uh, return us an answer. So it takes the existing code snippet and uh, with our prompts, uh, it returns a, a new code snippet that is going to be accessible. In this case, we've taken a div that was designed, excuse me, as an interactive element, a button that was meant to be clicked on, uh, which of course comes with no accessibility. Uh, the the doesn't declare its role as a screen reader. You can't get it again to get to it with a keyboard, and we've changed that to uh, a button tag. And so at this point, we would just go back to our source code, make the change to make sure that uh, knowing exactly we need to change that div to create a button, and then that way that will resolve that issue. Oh, yeah. So thank you all very much. Uh, we're excited to share here how we are using this modern technology in a place that's sorely needed to, to make sure that as the technology advances, we are advancing with it and uh, making sure that accessibility uh, is, is easy for folks to, uh, uh, to add into part of their process without uh, a huge amount of effort, knowledge, and uh, uh uh time time to do so thank you all I, i'd be happy to take any questions thank you kevin <laughs> i'm super excited about this yes uh right here in the front this is kevin andrews from georgetown university really appreciated sure. your talk this evening um i lead our it accessibility compliance program and this is really interesting because we're kind of having some conversations at the IT level about AI and how, for better or for worse, we can use it at the university. Um, I think they're still trying to figure that out, as we all are. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak to, it sounds like, I'm not sh unfortunately, I don't know much about your organization, but I was wondering if you could maybe speak for a minute or two about how teams have 
successfully integrated um, your product into their development processes, um, obviously without getting too into the weeds. I would be curious to hear about that. We're agile. Um, so I would just be interested in hearing about that and how we might be able to use that in our sprints. Yeah, absolutely. So to, to keep it somewhat high level, you know, there's there's several uh, areas in which that can that that can happen as, as as an agile part. I mean, regardless, we want to get in as early as and as often to to hit accessibility problems at a source. One of the uh, ways that uh, a colleague of mine puts it is that you know a bug is a bug whether it's a, a functional problem or an accessibility problem or a security problem or just a flat out you know infinite loop and we want to approach everything that way and and make sure that um, accessibility is part of that so whether that's starting early with the the design process uh, our customers uh, are are wanting more and more earlier and earlier so that um, these problems are are aren't created at the at, at the very beginning or they're caught extremely early so that they by the time their applications get to pr production you know they're as, as close as we can make them when these of course applications are ever evolving and so uh our our, our customers uh, uh you know we're fortunate events to have you know so many different tools that fit in uh, different places in the pipeline what we do is we work with our customers to kind of customize how they would best do it with both an initial phase of how we can start today to make the problem better, and then also how we can work towards tomorrow to make sure that the problem uh, gets is is more solved going going forward. So, you know, we'd probably want to sit down and chat about how what would work best for you all. But um, you know, we've kind of seen just about everything these days, so uh, I have I'm confident we would we would know how to help. And Mike is over here uh, in the front uh, if you want to chat afterwards. Um, I have uh, uh, other questions in the room, Ben. Sorry, Kevin. Oh, uh, ben, ben was someone else, but you, oh, can, okay. you can follow up if you like that. Oh, Mike no, is right good. in front of you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking. Oh, oh, got it. <laughs> here you go, Ben. Hey, Kevin, it's Ben at ArcTouch. Um, uh, hey, hey um, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think I remember you saying this a few weeks ago. Um, as of right now, the V2 tools um, that you demo today focused on web at the moment, not yet um, kind of taking native uh, into account, right? Maybe, maybe future that's state there. Yep. Cool. All right. Yep. Awesome. Uh, the third, that's phase uh, phase two of our, our Gen 2 tools is going to mm -hmm. be mobile as well. Awesome. Uh, because obviously that's, uh, that's where we go to next. Cool. Um, if within the web stack, um, uh, is a developer able to um, tailor the suggestions to different frameworks as of right now, or is it kind of pure uh, native HTML uh, for now? Yeah, the fixed suggestions. Uh, the first phase was more of the the raw HTML, so that you know you take that general understanding take it back to whatever your framework is, React, Flutter, Angular, what have you, um, and, and kind of apply it there. The, our, our initial state will be to uh, then provide you know, examples in those most popular frameworks. But then as we're refining our prompts, we want to be able to just have those return directly in the languages because that you know, would be one step easier. Uh, but you know, with, uh, with everything, that, that's a bit of a challenge too. So we're, we're working on that as well. Yeah, another question in the room. Uh, hi, Kevin. This is Jonathan Poole from CVS Health. Oh, Mr. Poole, great to hear. Great to hear your voice again. Uh, yeah, I was wondering: is there a model where the AI that detects accessibility defects can tell the AI that creates applications about its defects and teaches it? to avoid such defects? Yeah, so the idea of training AI models is, is really an important one. And it's, it's really an area where as leaders of, of accessibility in the space, we need to do everything as possible uh, as we can to make sure that what we put out is accessible because 
you know, if you're a Microsoft or a, a Google or an Asana, like your footprint is going to be incredibly impactful on uh, how what the the code that these models are trained on, how uh, uh, the 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 continued learning happens with the prompts that are returned. And so it's it's a really uh, interesting approach that we need to take. So, you know, these these models are trained on extremely large sets of data that um, uh, it's it's difficult to to pivot quickly, but it's really a long term goal for for the more good code we put out there, the more of that is trained to uh, um, to return and and when these models are asked for simple you won't have to specify that it needs to be accessible that will be an assumption that needs to be made and so hopefully uh, it'll probably be sometime in the future but you know our goal would be if, at events is if if our tools work and we're able to um uh provide more accessible code out there that will then further train the models and someday you won't need tools like ours to to make code accessible uh, these generative AI tools will 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 know how to do that on their own. So I'm not sure if I answered your question directly, but uh, those are those are the thoughts. I'm getting a nod, so that okay seems good. Uh, any other questions in the room? Yes, Jack. One second. Uh, hi, Kevin. I really enjoyed your presentation. Jack here. I'm a UX designer. That's why I want to know, you know, what kind of uh, uh, designer plugin you are developing uh, for Figma or Sketch or other tools. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, absolutely. So our design assistant is built for Figma at the moment. Um, you know, in a quick poll of our, our customers, Figma was overwhelmingly the, mo the most popular, but we are planning to uh, add support for you know, sketch and, and, and the well, uh, but yeah, the design assistant, it's really exciting. Um, it, any, any, audio, any component that you're developing, whether it's a tablet recording, uh, uh, whatever we, we match those with the audio pattern guide, make sure that, uh, as well as some other sources as well, uh, to make sure that, uh, those designs can be made accessible, uh, uh, from the design standpoint. So yeah, we're very excited about it. If there's uh, if people on the stream have questions, feel free to ping Meryl in the chat, and I'd be happy to to route them here. Um, I I have a question, Kevin, about uh, scanning of actual source code. So you showed a copilot model where something was identified at the authoring time, and you showed a scanning model in the DOM um, that addressed code. Uh, in production, essentially, right, or in, in a local development environment. Are you thinking about ways to basically do static analysis on a code base that would take some of the benefits of the GitHub Copilot kind of model, but do it like wholesale over an entire code base? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of our goals, uh, to be sure. Um, in one of the, and there's significant challenges with that, with that problem. Um, one is in order to be able to cover uh, accessibility to a certain extent, we have to be able to kind of automatically detect what type of element it is. Like, for example, if, if uh, in HTML, uh, it can be difficult to tell whether an element is a modal or a pop-up or, or different types of areas. If you know that if, if, if so, if a tool knows that this element is a modal, we can scan it for almost every um, uh, every accessibility issue there is. And right now, uh, we use multiple data streams in order to detect that information. So, of course, we look at the the code if it's available. We look at the uh, uh, um, uh, the syntax, but we also uh, one of the areas we do is uh, if it's rendered, whether it's in JS DOM or in the in the browser, we use additional data there. And so we have a plan for how we're going to do that. Um, that's just a, a little bit further out, but we're excited when that uh, that tool is going to be available because essentially what you'll be able to do is point it towards a code repository and get a, an accessibility output uh, uh, for all of your repositories. I'm I'm ex I'm looking forward to that. Thank Me you. Me too. <laughs>
questions in the room? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Kevin. Uh, this is followed from Hearst Magazines. Uh, I'm a product. I'm just out of curiosity here. I uh, never worked with accessibility, but now I think that I will start. Um, uh, thank you very much um, for the presentation that was very, very clear. I, I wonder, like, during your presentation, you mentioned Lighthouse and uh, what, what you are going to do if Google decides to improve that Lighthouse. I mean, first thing we would do is celebrate because uh, the way I feel in this industry is the more people doing good to solve problems, the better. Um, but, you know, like, great. There's there, there's a ton of tools out there. The more I, I guess that's my answer, the more 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 help, help out there for folks to make the more things accessible, the better. OK, um, there's a there's a YouTube question. Uh, sorry, give me one second. I just I'm I'm reading through here. Um, I'm in deep on the stream. Can you? You asked, can we take that as an input from developers when they are authoring these UI widgets? Kind of taking that guess away. I'm not sure what you're referring to specifically. Can you? Add a little more context to that question, and I will take another pass at it. Um, and then Anna, Anna, Anna. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, can events help with the service design uh, or the creation of service blueprints? I don't know what service blueprints are. Maybe you do, Kevin. Uh, I ha I, I I'm apologize. I, I'm not familiar with the service blueprint. Um, okay. I can I can speak a little bit about events as a, in general if that would help. But um, um, I'll let Anna uh, yeah. maybe do a follow up on that. There's a question in the room here. Hi, Kevin. Um, thank you for your demo and your talk today. It was really great. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm an accessibility front end engineer, and I'm curious about the example that you showcased today was for a tabless pattern, which is a pretty standard ARIA pattern guide um, example. I'm curious about how the events tool would handle any component that has non-trivial interactions or things that are not so easily uh, fit into any of the ARIA practicing uh, practice guide examples. Yeah, that's a great question because you know while. I would say that the majority of, of components fall into one of these categories. There's always custom. Everybody, you know, everything, every website is different to some extent. Uh, uh, somebody's got a, a good idea on how to improve it. And that's something to, to configure, to, to, to absolutely consider. So the way our approach to that is first, we, are, we, we have built out uh, our tool to recognize all of the different ARIA patterns, match them to the guides, plus some additional feedback uh, in areas where they're lacking to, to map those. The second thing that we've noticed is a lot of the, say, custom components that we see are really just kind of combination of existing patterns. And then we see components that are truly custom that uh, have uh, requirements that uh, we would need to focus on. And so that's that's also our pattern. Uh, the way we're approaching it, we will start with the most common, hit the uh, uh, analysis for combinations, and then work on uh, uh, the ability to address pure custom components as well. So um, tricky problems, exciting ones, but uh, a great question. Uh, the qu I'm going to follow it up in the uh, YouTube channel uh, about the question about, about taking input from the developer about what they want to try to do it's it's a question about intent like asking like setting the intent that this is a dialogue or a tab or accordion while asking copilot to create code for them um can you refresh us i think that's something that you showed there's like a comment mechanism that says like make me an accordion 
Yeah, it, it's it's really interesting the way the way GitHub works and the, the copilot. So you can essentially leave a, a a comment of what kind of you know general guidelines, and then and then you can ask GitHub copilot to to create some code for you. So what's what's interesting is when we created this tool, you know, just when we started getting into it, we thought, okay, so what we'll do is we'll say, hey, hey, copilot, make us a you know, develop us a, a tab list and. The events tool wouldn't have to do anything else besides you know, analyze the 10 results and then pick the one that's made accessible. But the problem was is that when we looked at 10 results, none of them at all were accessible. And so we had to, to actually take a, a much deeper approach, which uh, involved the two areas of, of technology that we focused on. One of them is the intent detection, whereas we're detecting that that's a tab list. Some of that uh, detection is, is user input. Uh, we take that. Some of it is kind of the the comment as well. Some of it is uh, just contextual. And then the second part is okay. You can't just say uh, you know, please return me a, a tab list. You need to be extremely clear with the prompt to say this needs to be uh, returned as a, this is a tab list. It has to be accessible. You have to have the screen reader areas, the 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 roles. The the prompt itself has to be extremely complex to make sure that you're getting the answer you need, and you have to be able to uh, work with the the generative AI model to make sure that the the results are deterministic. Uh, you have to make sure that it's going to return you an uh, an answer that is uh, the same every time, which is another challenge that uh, uh, we've worked through with these particular tools. Okay. Anyone else in the room have a question or concern, thought? Yes. Uh, Jonathan Poole again. Um, does AI have a role to play in helping large organizations with thousands of pages that have been created by dispersed uh, autonomous groups uh, arrive at accessibility in the th in the form of consistent representation across all of those pages does it have a does it have play can it play a role in identifying candidates for let's say the canonical representation that should then be propagated across the organization so let me let me try and rephrase to make sure I understand. Can AI detect a page uh, like a, a website amongst thousands that is a like a great example of accessibility to then propagate outwards to the other pages? Well, I meant that that let's say buttons or links can be all accessible, and yet they're not accessible because they're inconsistent across all of the pages of a site. And so to solve that problem, you need, you need, you can't use page level uh, analysis. And I'm wondering whether AI can be brought to bear to find the, let's say, some kind of consensus or uh, modal patterns that can, be that can be promoted into some kind of a design system uh, for the organization. Sure. I mean, the, the nice thing about, uh, uh, I mean, large numbers of pages are easy. Um, events can scan a thousand pages in, in four minutes using uh, all of the the AI modeling that we do to create that intent and detect how, uh, how each interactive element is developed. Um, I think the, the guidelines that you're referring to are kind of already established with the ARIA pattern guide, the, the, the WCAG criteria, and that, and that sort of thing. So, uh, I, you know, this may be something we want to discuss in a little more detail. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, uh, I mean, the, answer, the short answer is we don't even know what all AI can do. And so one wouldn't really want to close the door on anything. Okay. Well, oh, yes. Great. Um, I think we'll, we'll do this question and one more question if there is one. Hi, thank you again. My name is Daniela Decker. Uh, this is my first um, 
meeting. So I'm excited to be a part of the group here in New York City. Um, I'm an independent consultant for the International Finance Corporation and the World Bank and a few other clients as well. And I'm particularly interested not so much from a developer or designer kind of standpoint on the technical piece, but more so on how AI impacts hiring and retention specifically for uh, disabled employees or disabled job seekers. I think that is a really important fundamental element of how we talk about AI and how it is used to streamline and support HR teams, yet is often discriminatory. So I would love to hear kind of your perspective on those challenges as well as opportunities to ensure that AI is not biased when we're looking at disabled job seekers and people seeking employment. Yeah. Uh the the bias instilled in AI is an is an incredibly serious problem, and the the problem lies is that the 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 data used to train and and these models is out there is and implicitly and explicitly biased as well. And so, yeah, this is a an extremely uh, complex topic that I I don't think I think everyone is trying to work through. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer, except for that it should be everyone's goal to, to identify and uh, uh, put forth examples of, of non-bias, uh, call it out where we see it, and, and act for change so that, again, just like when we're looking at accessible code, uh, the more good content out there that can be used to train these models, the better, the more improvement we'll see. But, of course, this is going to take a lot of time. I've also seen um, a handful of organizations publishing AI ethics guidelines uh, that their organization is committed to. Um, so if you're in a position to enact that kind of policy, I encourage you to, uh, to research and see what other organizations are doing. Um, I know Google, Microsoft, you know, the usual su suspects are, are publishing these kinds of ethical guidance. Asana does too. Um, so that's, that's somewhere to look for inspiration and also a, a call to action. Uh, there are also a handful of other, uh, events that we have recorded on our YouTube channel that relate to AI and bias. Uh, and I think it's a great idea for a topic for another meetup to really do a deep dive there. So thank you for the question. Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Natalie Austin. Um, I'm a accessibility product specialist at Edward Jones. Um, I had a question relating to um, kind of these, um, or let me let me go back a step. Um, I'm hearing a lot about Aria, <laughs> and I have a bit of pause uh, because I come from an environment where it's so overused to a point where it's not useful at all. Um, I know that some of the W3C patterns, um, for instance, like radio buttons, um, those are pure ARIA. They're not actually just using good semantic HTML. So I guess I'm curious how these AI tools can um, suggest the right patterns, because I guess I'm just concerned of, you know, promoting so much aria and just getting away from good semantic html uh, yeah absolutely i think i think uh in my opinion that's keeping these tools in in perspective um these tools are not replacing good old-fashioned human judgment knowledge and understanding and we need to treat them as well like i kind of think of it's silly but i kind of think of these generative ai, AI tools as like a, a really great shovel like they make the job easier, but they don't tell you where or how to dig or how to solve your problem. So uh, my only point being, we have to use judgment when using any new tools, anything that we're st that's still evolving to make sure that we're using it in a way that that makes sense. And I couldn't agree with your your uh, your comments more. We need to use a lot of judgment and and use it in a way that that helps and instead of hinders. Thank you to Kevin for joining us tonight. Thank you again.